I will start with a question from Chris Davis. He's a fellow in, in Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, he's asking me to give the question on his behalf. Uh, so he's saying, um, so uh, Dr. Dr. Tobin, uh, when do you use AU vests on all liver tumors, both at presentation and follow up? Uh, I mean, so do you use AU vests? On, um, we do, yes. On, uh, and, we and, do. There are uh, the reason, and some, I know some people use multi hands. Um, our our preference is Evist, um, just because of, of the time. But we find the hepat um, the hepatobiliary phase to be an important um, part of our assessment. Okay. And we do use it at all time points because that we do see lesions that pop up or things that were missed as giant tumors become less giant. Um, sometimes lesions sprout up that you know that were hidden because they were thought to be just a single lesion. Okay, great. Uh, Claude, did you, you can say your question now. You can give your question. Oh, uh, well, uh, be, I, I do have a couple questions, but before I get to that, I would just say that um, the way I look at it, and Alex, tell me if you agree or disagree, it's that uh, adult LIRADS doesn't work in children, but that's not to say that a LIRADS like system. I mean, it may end up looking quite different, but that some sort of systematic approach to the diagnosis or the differential diagnosis in children might someday develop. Would you would you agree with that? I, I think it's possible. I, I think the again the hard part for us in developing a system is that we're we're not dealing with a screening population with a highly prevalent disease, um, and so to use it in in that setting is hard is going to always be hard for us. Um, with a low prevalence, the getting to predictive values that are are useful um, is going to be hard. That's where something like pretext is helpful. Uh, you know, our, our tumors often present at eight, 10 centimeters in size, so they're not diagnostic mysteries. Um, and the age range, it's often obvious what it is. Um, whether you know a younger kid is going to be hepatoblastoma, an older kid is going to be HCC, and a kid in between is often going to be um, an undifferentiated embryonal sarcoma. Um, and so it, so that, that's, the, I guess, the part that's hard. Um, the place where, again, we need help and more systematic assessment are these patients with multiple lesions. Um, I think that's where, where we'll find um, a LIRADS tool helps us. Mm -hmm. Um, and you could argue that pretext is a very similar tool. Um, it's not, LIRADS is designed as a screening tool to help predict the likelihood of HCC in adults. Um, we're, again, not, uh, and so pretext, but it, but the other part of LIRADS is it's a consistent structured reporting system. Um, and pretext is a consistent structured reporting system in that sense. Um, it, but it, it does not give the prediction side. For the patients with multiple lesions, that's where we're really going to need a prediction system. Okay. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Well, we can you, we can continue this discussion offline and 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 yeah. and, and uh, see my, you know what the what the right approach might be. Um, now, um, along those lines, um, I think it'll be very important to get your group as involved as possible within the uh, lexicon development that we're doing, so that. Uh, we're developing terminology that is useful uh, for pediatric imaging and not just terminology that, you know, we're hoping will be useful for adult imaging. But again, that can be a conversation that occurs, uh, you know, in, in another setting. Now, yeah. I do have a couple, well, one, I do have a couple questions for you. Now, one question is about the hemangiomas. Um, this, it was beyond the scope of today's lecture, so that's, I understand why you didn't necessarily comment on it, but I, I'm just curious. Why do these hemangiomas involute? It's, I mean, they're neoplasm, so what is it that makes them go away? It, it's one of those that's unknown to me as well. That's the other reason I didn't cover it. No, I, I, don't, okay. I don't know. Um, uh, there are very few tumors that involute, um, and hemangiomas are one, but I don't know why. I don't know I what, what it is about them that, that makes that happen. Okay. And it's not just that the background liver is growing and then by comparison they shrink, they're, they're, they're actually getting smaller. Correct. Yeah, okay. we, can, we watch them get smaller, on the, especially on those 
um, vocal ones where we follow them with ultrasound and watch them disappear. Interesting. Okay. Um, another and question. You can see, like, they go from five centimeters, eight centimeters to to not visible at all. Interesting. That's really interesting. Uh, it'd be interesting to study the biology of that. Now, how how similar are hemangiomas to malignant vascular tumors like angiosarcomas? Are they are they similar? The the pediatric hemangiomas yeah. or they are different tumor types, uh, and I guess the other thing I didn't mention, so the, these tumors, hemangiomas, used to be referred to as hemangioendotheliomas. Hemangioendotheliomas are a different type of tumor, um, and so the pathologists, the vascular pathologists, don't like to confuse the terms. Um, so the angiosarcomas can look very similar to hemangiomas. They can have that similar type of enhancement pattern. Sometimes they'll have bigger vessels or unusual vessels within it that help you to differentiate. Um, but the, the big difference is they continue growing. Um, mm -hmm. They don't involute with time, but they continue growing. Um, and so that's often, there are some other tumor markers that they look at. I see. Okay. Well, that's um, an area they are different. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, when you were talking about, um, the uh, hepatoblastomas, uh, you mentioned that they can be multifocal and that if multifocal, then the treatment of choice might end up being a liver transplant. So mm -hmm. that's interesting to me. Um, when they're multifocal, what is the mechanism of multifocality? Is it intrahepatic metastatic dissemination or is it multicentric development of multiple, essentially de novo cancers, or is that not known? I think it's a mix. Um, we've definitely seen both, you know, we, and I think the third one I would add to it would be um, vascular uh, invasion that then causes dissemination. Hmm. Um, I think all three of those apply. You know, I see with multifocal disease, it's definitely more common to see that type of vascular involvement. Um, and so see, look, seeing the portal vein um, with tumor in vein or the hepatic veins with tumor in vein, it, even if it's a more peripheral vessel, I see that more frequently. Um, we will, but then there are times we'll see um, patients who develop multiple lesions over time. Those tend to be more of the kids with the tumor predisposition syndrome, like um, Beck with Wiedemann or familial adenomatous polyposis, something like that. Interesting. Um, so despite the fact that sometimes it may be um, vascular invasion or metastatic spread, even in that setting, liver transplant can, can cure these kids and there's not recurrence of occult metastatic disease outside the liver? Correct, yeah. Even um, when there are pulmonary metastases, if they can clear the metastases, they can do a transplant. Wow, okay. Um, and so they do things, I mean, they can, it, uh, they're looking for a chemo to shrink away the pulmonary metastases and most times that's all that's needed. Um, occasionally they'll do pulmonary metastectomies um, to resect it, and they'll need a little more time to make sure that they don't come back before they would do a transplant then. But if the lungs are clear, they'll give them a transplant. That is amazing. And, and they are big tumors. The other thing um, I didn't really touch on is, in, you know, in a multifocal, would they ever do an ablation? Um, and uh, we're, in general, the oncologists have not been big on ablation. Um, of hepatoblastoma with multifocal disease, mostly because survival can be quite good um, with a transplant. And we're talking 80 plus percent, 85 percent long-term survival with transplant. Wow. Um, and so, and, and things like an ablation are unknown. Um, you are, of course, with transplant trading one disease for another, um, and, and needing lifelong immunosuppression for a baby is, you know, is a big deal. Um, and so we're we're working on how can we reduce the use of transplant. So things like ablation may may come up, um, but for now it's mostly compassionate care. I see. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, are there other questions? I, I do have one other question, but if there's other questions from the group, you know, please. Uh, I I don't mean to. So, so not, oh, yeah, the, 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 there is a question, but go ahead. Go ahead and mention your question, and then others can also ask. Okay. Well, well, my, my last question is uh, you mentioned that I, I think it was in that child with hepatoblastoma. I think it was a hepatoblastoma. You pointed out that there were 
uh, in the hepatobiliary phase, you saw these hepatobiliary phase hyperintense nodules. And I think you said that you just, you sometimes call them adenoma-like uh, lesions or something along those lines. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting because that's not the most common appearance for adenoma in adults, you know, for them to be taking up uh, mm -hmm. the gadozetate like that. Um, mm -hmm. Almost you know, always beta catenin activated adenoma. Ah, okay, so they're beta catenin. And so those those are the ones that will usually do it. I see. Okay. All right. Well, that's so. So that actually is similar to what's been described in the adult literature. Okay. Well, listen. Yeah. Uh, Al, by the way, I forgot to say, Alex, that was just a phenomenal lecture. Sorry, I forgot to start with the most important thing. That was just a fantastic lecture, despite despite those incredibly. <laughs> Uh, wrong things you said about LIRADS not working. But despite that, it was a great, great lecture. So thank you. I didn't Alex. say it doesn't work. I said it shouldn't be used, just like it says in the Word document. Oh, good. Okay. Don't, right, worry, right, don't, right. don't be defensive, right. Alex. It's okay. It's okay, okay. not to use it. Yeah, yeah we, we, we can do every effort to just to protect Claude from. Yeah, I know. Please protect my feelings. Nitro plus free. Yeah. <laughs> So, so there is a question that shows you how kind we are here to you, Alex, in Texas. One of our uh, people, Viet, from Baylor College of Medicine, yeah. is going to do fellowship with you guys next year. So we're giving you our people. And, and these I, I can't wait to be able to work with her. <laughs> We've been working over email so far. <laughs> okay, great. He is having a question for you. Viet, would you like to ask yeah. a question? Yes, hi, Dr. Tobin, it's Viet. Um, thank you, Dr. Alsayas, um, for introducing me. Uh, my question was about the pretext and post-text, um, and I was wondering if at Cincinnati Children's, you would expect you know, your fellows to um, know details of um, pretext and post-text and incorporate that into dictations where it would apply? Yes. Yeah, um, and, you know, not at day one, of course. Um, and you'll probably see a very similar lecture to this next year. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's part of what we do. Um, we do see a very large number of, of children with hepatoblastoma at Cincinnati Children's. Um, we're fortunate um, that a lot of the people running the current international liver tumor trial, um, a lot of the primary investigators from North America are at Cincinnati Children's. Um, and so we get referrals from across the world and, and see new patients with hepatoblastoma every week. Um, so even though it's a rare disease, we see a lot of it in Cincinnati. So you'll okay. get familiar with it, but it's um, it comes with time. Okay. Okay. That's great to know. Thank you. This was just sort of the only context I'd seen it in. Um, yeah. So I was just curious about that. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure you will do excellent, be it in, in Baylor, in uh, Cincinnati. So, oh, thank you, Dr. Alcayas. So, so I actually have a question, last question, Dr. Uh, Tobin. Uh, yeah. For this, for the uh, nodules in Fontaine, uh, there was a paper about talking about the porto venous phase and late phase washout. Would this really... Uh, uh, would this really work in differentiation between the, uh, the, the regenerative nodules and the HSC? Uh, as far as I remember, they said that in HSCC, they actually wash out in the porto venous phase, but the Fontaine as the nodules work, or regenerative nodules wash out in the delayed phase, rather. So, uh, uh, you know, would this work in, in the differentiation, or what do you think? Um, we use that um, to to help guide biopsy. Um, so the problem in Fontan is uh, these patients will have tens of nodules, hundreds of nodules, um, and to differentiate the ones that are worrisome from not worrisome. And so we do look for washout as our um, and arterial phase hyper enhancement. We look for those two features to help guide us um, towards something to biopsy, especially if one nodule is behaving differently than other nodules. Um, or several nodules are behaving differently than the majority of nodules. That's what guides us towards the biopsy. Um, I, I wouldn't say that all biopsies are positive, um, but that has helped us to find hepatocellular carcinoma in these patients. Yeah, but uh, but what and about the, in those patients? The are often the phase. Uh, what about those out yes. in the phase? Hmm? It is more in the that delayed phase. It's more in the delayed phase. 
We do see, yes, that's what we see in the delayed phase, not the portal venous phase. I think, let's see, I can, I know I'm still projecting my slides on this one um, slide. That's there. This was a, one that was a suspicious nodule. Um, so it had that arterial phase hyper enhancement, slight washout on the portal venous phase, but in the delayed phase, there is that more washout. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, this is, Type, type of lesion that would be worrisome for us and we would sure um, that would be the type we biopsy yeah okay all right all right uh, I mean uh, I'm just saying that because I remember that the, 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 that particular paper uh, mentioned that fontaine nodules the regenerative nodules also yeah. demonstrate wash out in the delayed phase and this yes. is different <laughs> if you look into the portal venous phase HSC wash out in the portal venous phase rather than the delete phase. That's what the, the, the that, yeah. Yeah, my understanding if we're talking about the same paper is that um, most of the lesions were not biopsied in that paper. Mm. And so it was the, the calling them regenerative nodules was based on um, long-term follow-up. Sure. And we know that Fontan HCC can be slow developing mm -hmm. um, and slow growing at the beginning. Okay. And so, so that that's the one concern, um, and again, it, this is something that guides a, wor a biopsy for us on a worrisome lesion, Perfect. particularly one that's different. Perfect. And I don't know our our incidents. Our, we haven't put together um, we haven't put together our performance on that. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. And with that, this will end our session. And again, Alex, this was a phenomenal lecture. This was terrific, really. Uh, I mean, in-depth knowledge and understanding. And, and you give us fund of knowledge about pediatric liver tumors. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me today.